Hello, everyone. I'm Candace Porter, and I'm really excited to be here today. I am here with Joanne Richard. Joanne is a very experienced project manager and leader in the cosmetics industry, and she studied for and passed the PMP exam in 2024. We're going to ask her to share some of her tips and recommendations on how to best prepare for the PMP exam and then actually sitting down and taking it. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've really been looking forward to this. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your career path that led you to pursue and pass the 2024 PMP exam? Okay, I spent over two decades uh, in the beauty industry uh, as a formulator and a manager. I uh, came out uh, to Nevada to watch over my parents and I was looking for a way to work more remotely. As you can imagine, uh, R&D uh, is very much hands-on, on-site. Uh, so I wanted to find a way that I could tap into my skills in people, product, and portfolio management and uh, still, you know, utilize those skills and 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 really help uh, product launches. Um, and a friend in the industry recommended that I take the uh, PMP, uh, and I did. <laughs> Fantastic. And for our listeners out there, R&D, we're talking about research and development. Is that correct? Correct. You know, how did you structure your study plan? What resources and tools were most helpful for you in preparing for the exam? Okay. So these were my resources. Um, I did take a 35-hour prep course online uh, that supplied mock tests. Um, and I also became a member of PMI. That's actually quite important um, because it really uh, gives you access to uh, some really great tools like the study hall that they had where you had uh, practice questions and you also had uh, two additional mock tests uh, through that. Uh, I got the latest edition of PEMBOOK um, and the uh, Agile uh, book, the uh, PDF uh, format uh, that they also had uh, on PMI. Um, and I also was uh, actively using the I, uh, AI engine PMI Infinity, uh, the PMP exam simulator, uh, as well as their vocabulary cards. Uh, so those were kind of the, the tools. Um, and my study plan basically was uh, I took the 35-hour course. Uh, afterwards, I reviewed the PMBOK and the Agile uh, books um, and pretty much gathered my notes into uh, eight workflows, uh, kind of domains of uh, project, product, people, you know, all, all, all of that. So number one would be like the initiation, the developmental approach, the life cycle. Number two would be the planning uh, baselines. Number three was engagement, stakeholders and communication. Number four was team management, empowerment. Uh, number five was risk management, um, identifying risk and also managing in a VUCA um, uh, culture and environment. Number six were metrics, schedule, budget, benefits, uh, change metrics. Uh, number seven was project work, uh, dealing with procurement and quality. And la lastly, number eight was delivery, achieving and sustaining deliverables. So it, within those eight workflows, um, I was able to just put all my notes uh, so that it made sense for me based on my uh, experience and background as a manager in the beauty industry, uh, since most of my skills would fall in one of those eight. So it's kind of, it made sense to uh, gather it in that way. So this was really important um, to really get the right framework. Um, and I would say once I you know, got my notes, I proceeded as uh, much, as many times as I could to do the cycle of study, test, review. So that's the power cycle right there. Um, and taking that cycle and repeating that as many times as possible before I took the PMP. So I would study for a few days, then I would take a mock test. Then I would meticulously review the right and the wrong answers. Not, and you might say, oh, well, why do the right answers? Because I'm going to know why I got it right <laughs> and make sure that I really implemented that and, and highlighted um, that, okay, in this area I'm, I'm solid on. And, uh, and it, it really helped me to know exactly what I had to study. 
Um, and for the wrong answers, it allowed me to see, okay, what are the learnings? What, where did I get tripped up? What was the principle or pattern that I, that I missed? Uh, and I took, you know, whatever that explanation was, whether it was from the study hall, whether it was from the simulator, a lot of times I'll ask for more details from the AI simulator and be like, okay, could you expand on this? And then it would take the explanation and go into a lot more detail to really flesh it out for me. So I understood, oh, that's where I got it wrong. Um, so it was really key for me to understand that. Then I would take that and I would put that in my notes. Um, and then, you know, after doing that, and, you know, at first it was grueling because you're like, I'm going through each and every question, but it was so worth it because I really got a great understanding of where I got things wrong. Um, and I also was able to really strengthen like, okay, this, I have it down. Um, so I did this about five times. Uh, so I took about five uh, mock tests and each time it was really exciting um, because each time I got to see my scores go higher and higher uh, until I was over 80%. Um, and so the whole journey basically took me seven weeks, but it, it was full time. It was, you know, I, I wasn't working at the time. So that was like full time, seven weeks, uh, you know, five mock tests, got it done. Um, and uh, if I was working, this process probably would have taken me about three to four months, which is, you know, pretty standard. I've talked to other people who were working and studying for the PMP. Uh, some people took a little longer, um, but, you know, mostly it was around three to four months. How long did it take you for each of those mock exams? There were two hours. That was really good practice. Um, you know, the, the actual test, as you know, was about, you know, three plus uh, hours, I think, close to four. So, it, you know, having that practice of taking the test is very, very, very key um, and, and getting used to that. The mock exams that you were taking, those were directly through Project Management Institute? Uh, two of them were, and, and three of them were outside of that. So, uh, you know, through the other programs that I got to. And what's great is you can get mock tests, uh, you know, uh, through PMI, you can uh, either get additional mock tests or you can get them through other uh, sources. They have books with mock tests and usually uh, PMI um, uh, based authors, you know, people who have worked with PMI, I would usually, you know, purchase books from them because they know exactly, you know, what kind of test and what kind of questions they, a lot of times they worked on the questions themselves. Uh, so they would be the perfect people to get the mock, um, mock tests. I've heard a lot of people talk about utilizing project management institutes. And so we'll make sure that we share a link to that because yep. if you really want to go through those mock exams and get more and more comfortable, I think with the timing and with the content itself, I think that's really, really valuable. I also went through a boot camp, you know, back when I was preparing for the PMP, which was almost 15 years now. <laughs> and I found it so valuable. I mean, it was hardcore. It was very compressed. I went to four back-to-back -back days and it was 35 hours. I mean, we had so much content thrown at us. So I always like to tell people, you know, you're really going to learn how to pass the PMP exam, they are not teaching you how to be a project manager. And so exactly. I always ask people to separate it out in your mind. It doesn't matter if you have, you know, six years or 26 years of project management experience, you have to learn exactly what Project Management Institute wants you to know to pass the PMP exam. And that's what some of these professional organizations are here to do. Did you find that really helped you as far as increase the knowledge to prepare for the exam? Yes, yes, because exactly like you said, you're not being prepared to be a project manager. They actually pretty much assume that you have a little bit of that, of that experience. What you're being prepared for is to take the test. <laughs> I think it's really key to separate a little bit at first and almost see it as, okay, it's all about what does PMI expect? Did you go and sit for the exam in person or did you take it virtually? I uh, took it uh, in person 
And I highly recommend it. Um, I think it's really key to remember that, you know, anything could go wrong sometimes when you're at home and, you know, the internet, you know, comes out or something like that. And it just was like, oh, less chances of something going wrong when you're at a proctored place uh, center. Um, and the proctor is right there in case there is anything that happens. So you always have like a witness, you know, like, okay. <laughs> and also it the, was zero distraction. I mean, they're super, super quiet, super, super focused. Uh, and that's exactly what you need. That's my recommendation. If possible, if you can do it in person, do it in person. If not, definitely make sure that your internet is well connected, that um, you will have no distraction uh, whatsoever. You know, everyone's out of the house or things are closed up and, uh, and that you're able to really uh, focus. I couldn't agree with you more. I also tested in person and I actually used every minute of the time allocation. So I remember getting down to my last minute and submitting my exam and I had so much anxiety because I expected my score just to pop up on the screen and it didn't. Um, I was a little relieved and I really wanted it to pop up. But when I did get notified that I'd passed, I remember being so excited because yeah. that's a very long exam to sit for. And yes. I was sure mentally if I could go through that again. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I want to talk about is how they split it into three. So you had your first 60, your second 60, your third 60. You really need to be thinking this is not a sprint, but a marathon. Uh, you have to pace yourself. Um, I was definitely at first shaken by my first 60. The second 60 went much more smoother and the third 60 I, I breezed, which is great. But I think it was just because I finally just got acclimated to the testing and to the questions. And I was, I was, I was in the groove. The first 60, just kind of pace yourself, get used to it. Don't be, you know, you might be a little bit like, Oh, Oh, what's going on? Just uh, allow yourself to calm down. And then it, the rest of the test will go smooth, more, much more smoothly as you, as you kind of get into a rhythm of, of thought the type of questions that they had, I would say about we're 60, 40, uh, situational agile questions compared to more process-oriented questions. The situational ones were about hybrid or moving away from predictive. Um, and there were only a few calculation questions, like a, literally a handful, like CPI, SPI, EVM, uh, percent risk impact, things like that. Mostly di more difficult to moderate. And, and if you go on the PMI study hall, you'll know exactly what I mean. Uh, they actually rate the mock test and practice questions according to uh, easy, moderate, difficult, expert. The majority were uh, moderate and difficult. Um, and then next was the expert and then very little easy. Focus on making sure you fully understand those those moderate, difficult, and expert questions and understand why their answers were the way that they were. Some of the methods that helped me, the process of elimination, be, uh, you know, I wrote down A, B, C, D. Like you're, you have a, a in the proctor test, you have a pencil and a, and a paper. Cross things out. And just by physically doing that, it actually made it go faster. Um, you might think, oh my gosh, it's going to take too much time to write A, B, C, D or, you know, whatever. It's like, no, it, it forces your mind to be like, yep, got rid of D, got rid of E. Oh, th these two. Oh, this is right. Done. Uh, so that's something that really helped uh, speed up. The other thing too is um, you want to really be key on what's the asking verb. Are they asking for what's next, what to prevent, to avoid, what what do I need, what's the exception? You know, so you really want to make sure you are clear on the ask of the question. Then you want to visualize the question in your mind before you even look at the answer options. You want to visualize the question in your mind. You're a project manager. You've been doing this for a while. And plus you've got this training. You have to learn to trust your gut, especially after taking many mock tests, you're going to develop a good sense of, oh, I think I know where they're going. Okay. So trust that. So when you visualize it and trust it, then you're able to first, before you see the, look at the answers, kind of think, okay, what's the logical thing? Oh, it's involving a risk. The risk register has to be somewhere, you know, that that's usually the next logical step is to log that in. 
PMI is very step by step. So you might think, oh, well, that's a small step. There's all other important things to do. Uh -uh 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 -uh. PMI is very key on making sure you know exactly the right step that's next and usually documenting or, you know, or assessing or analyzing, usually those steps are very, very important. They don't want you to skip those steps. I would say once you have like one or two or three eliminated, it, it becomes quicker to the, use the keywords that you, you've seen to be able to identify, okay, this one, this one is it. This one lines up with what I was thinking. It's addressing the, the, the ask of the question to move on very quickly. You want to know uh, when to escalate and when to consult. For some reason, they really want to make sure you know that. Definitely make sure you study that and are aware of in what situations you escalate and consult. And it's usually about uh, some principles that are in place. Uh, like when something goes out of scope or you know when something is um, outside of, uh, uh, of your realm of control, uh, usually it's escalation and, and consulting. There's certain principles that you will see as you take the mock test of what PMI is expecting. Number one, they love order. Besides the steps, they 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 love order. Um, they like things being done in a, in a proper order. They'll give you options where it, it's two steps ahead. It's not, it's not that it's incorrect. It's just two or three steps ahead. Make sure you look and see if there's something that's a lot more like also correct, but it's a lot more next step. Usually that's the right answer. Another principle is ask, analyze, assess first before taking action. Uh, a lot of times they'll trip you up and say, oh yeah, do this, do that. And then look at the option that says assess the situation or analyze, you know, uh, the, the risk or, or you know, um, uh, ask for more information. A lot of times that could be the right answer because again, they want to see, are you going to just jump into action or are you going to do the proper assessment first? PMI really believes that your team is her priority. So as a project manager, they expect you to be more proactive than reactive. So when it comes to team situations, you really need to be aware of that. So I'm always suspicious of any answer uh, on a team question that says, ignore, wait, act like this didn't happen. Yeah, that's usually wrong. Uh, look for the solution that will uh, is, is a proactive, empowering coaching project, uh, project manager would do that would help a situation avoid escalation or getting worse. They're also keen on consensus and collaboration versus dictating and giving directives. You usually you wanna discuss it with all the stakeholders. You wanna get it, it all the input. You wanna get the team input. You wanna get consensus. If the option is ignoring that, then something's, you know, be a little suspicious. Uh, lastly, uh, the agile mindset, coaching, encouraging, and empowering, very big for PMI. Uh, they really want a project manager that is not, going to just tell the team what to do, but you will will uh, foster, encourage, um, empower them, uh, help them to, to come to the realization of what the best solution is. In encouraging, those are key words that, you know, the minute you see that, most likely that's the answer. Yeah, these methods will definitely save you time. They'll allow you to focus on the question that needs the most uh, attention. Um, and of course, the more you do the, the mock test and, and do a thorough review of the mock test, it's like a muscle, a brain muscle that you're using again and again, so that when you're actually at the race, you know, taking the test, it's like, okay, you get yourself going and then you'll be steady like the, the marathon and able to make it all the way to the end. Were there any specific areas, you know, agile, hybrid project management, predictive that you found a bit more challenging? And if so, how did you overcome that? In the beauty industry, especially in R&D, we were using agile before agile, you know, became big. We were already uh, of utilizing that mindset, utilizing uh, iterative um, and collaborative approaches. For me, it was almost kind of natural, you know, because it kind of flowed already on how my mind was was thinking and how, how it was like, oh, okay, wait a minute, let's regroup, let's look, let's what, you know, uh, it, I didn't call it retrospective, but I called it learnings. We had technical learning plans. Um, and, and that came from looking at what 
we happened in the past submission and 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 you know what where did we not correlate with the with with our client was marketing you know um and and where where we 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 did great and where we didn't and what was the learning from it and what are some of the things we can implement to uh improve so already those things um i i was using so that for me was was not so much of a challenge but what was a challenge was all the calculating the different charts and graphs and i was not used to that so that was cool to be able to learn that and to get used to just being like okay uh you know uh the bac and 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 what's the contingency budget and all that being able to assess risk with the percent impacts and quantitative um measuring and uh, of risk and all the different p formulas uh you know the communication channels you know <laughs> Uh, things like that that um you know were 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 pretty important so that part i think was actually more like oh i got to really you know get these formulas down you know <laughs> i definitely benefited from having been working in a more you know agile uh, industry, you know, c compared to most, to be honest, uh, at the time. Uh, so I, I'm really thankful for that. There are a lot of formulas. I remember learning all of the earned value management formulas yep. Yep. and federal government uses earned value management a lot. I also work with a lot of construction companies that really use it for the test. Yes. Memorizing them is important but really yes. understanding their meaning and when you would use them and how you would use them. I think that's critical. The PMBOK guide, the current version, very thick. Also the agile guide that you referenced. What do you think is most important in there? As far as the agile guide, definitely read that from end to end, because it definitely helps to get that right mindset, uh, get the vocabulary, uh, you know, that was my main purpose. I understood the principles really well, but I, the vocabulary that would explain those principles and how PMI communicates those principles was very, very key. Definitely fleshed out the principles very well. The PMBOK, I looked at the uh, the way the ch chapters were organized and I just focused on the areas where I, I tended to get a lot of wrong answers. The more detailed risk management parts, you know, the more detailed, you know, uh, procurement uh, stuff and things like that, that, that was still very new to me. Those areas I kind of d dove into more detail uh, in the PMBOK um, and, and took advantage of kind of like, okay, this is PMI giving you a view into what's the, the reasoning behind uh, the way that the, you know, you, you approach uh, quality, procurement, you know, uh, metrics, timing, whatever that topic is uh, that you're going into. And just and it, it have some good visuals in there, some good charts, some good uh, tables that, that can help kind of put things in the right perspective for you. And it, they were very, very helpful. So I remember when I was studying for the PMP, I was also working full time, as I know a lot of people do. I was going to work long hours, Monday through Friday, and then I was coming home on the weekends and just studying all weekend. It was like cramming for college exams for me. I'm curious your experience with managing stress and staying motivated throughout the PMP process when you were preparing for it, when you were learning all of this new information. Do you have any advice or tips that you would give the viewers? Absolutely. And this is so funny because I've really learned a lot about how to manage stress during studying through the study of the PMP. It was very, very much concentrated. I basically, um, you know, did full days of, you know, where I was hydrating. Yeah. Hydration, drink plenty of water, uh, eat regularly, uh, every two, three hours, just have a little meal and then put yourself on a timer. Uh, I put myself on 40 minutes, five minute break after an hour and a half. I did a, just, you know, something else for 10, 15 minutes. And, you know, when you, you know, I had a house, so, you know, I put this away, took the garbage out, the dishes, you know, little, little things, not more than that, because I, after 15 minutes, I had my buzzer. I had to go back, back to studying. 
And I did it in these small chunks and I planned everything out. Uh, so I knew exactly like, okay, this weekend, I'm going to focus on these areas and I'm going to do my study and I'm going to take my test tomorrow. And I'm going to spend the rest of the day reviewing the test um, and, and, and learning from, from, you know, from those answers. Uh, so, you know, my cycles would take anywhere between three to four days. Uh, again, so that would be like two weekends, you know what I mean? Um, where you would do the studying, the test and, and the review. Uh, and then you would start the cycle again. Uh, and if you did it and, and, and that, um, you know, they, they have a name, uh, uh Pomodoro, I Pomodoro. Think, where, yeah, you, you, you study for a period of time, then you take a break for five minutes. Some people are, it's like 30 minutes. Some people's 20, some people are 40. I, I like the 40 because it, it was like 45 minutes, then 45 minutes. That was an hour, you know, an hour and a half. And then, you know, I, I, I had it blocked, you know, my day pretty much blocked in, in that way, you know, so, um, it, it, it was, it, it worked, it worked well for me. Um, but it, 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 the key is being consistent, um, you know, giving your, your body, uh, the, the, the energy and the, you know, sleep full seven, eight hours, if you can, uh, that will definitely help your, your brain, uh, giving your brain what it needs and sleep and water are the key, are, are key, uh, and, and, you know, energy and, and, and eating well, and then giving it a break, giving it a break. Um, and I celebrated, you know, when I, when I got an increase, I was like, I'm going to watch half an hour of my favorite show. Yay. You know, like right. you know, just something to get me excited about, um, you know, taking the next mock test and, and improving, you know, and I was like, yes, I earned my, my stream streaming for the day or you know, whatever it is. So, um, kind of reward yourself and, and everything. And before you know it, I just, you know, cause I had my plan, I checked, you know, and, and, oh gosh, we're project managers. So we're just naturally you know, anal and a total like into, you know, I got to be detailed and I have my plan and everything in my checklist. So use it, use it up, you know, and, 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 and do your checklist and be just like, yep, I got, got this, got that, got this. And, uh, and, and it will go by very, very quickly. You'll get really excited. You'll feel a lot more confident, uh, as uh, towards the end. Um, and then, you know, make sure you schedule your test and, uh, and, and, and go. That's wonderful. Thank you for that. It reminds me when I was active duty air force, I had to go through weather forecasting school and it was many, many months and it was oh, wow. very technical. I mean, we were all day in the classroom for many, many months. It wasn't like college where you go for an hour or so, and then you go and focus on a different topic. I mean, we were in the classroom all day long. Our job was to learn our jobs. And right. the Air and Education Training Command for the Air Force follows a similar process that you recommended, where we would really hit it hard for 50 minutes. And we got a 10 minute break once every hour to get up, go walk around, you know, have a snack, get something to drink. And then we'd go back and we'd study for the next hour. And that's exactly how we would operate. And they've done a lot of research on that. So there's got to be something yep. to it if they're running all of their technical schools in that same way. Yep. Makes total sense. So you did mention earlier PMI's infinity tool. And yep. for anyone that's just learning about this or hearing about it, I know that PMI has pushed out several communications, but can you just tell us a little bit more about that tool? What's the purpose of it? Is uh, there cost associated with it? Just tell our viewers what it is, if you don't mind. No problem. It's one of the uh, uh, GPT channels that, um, let's say, for example, if you have a uh, chat GPT or, 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 or some sort of vehicle for AI. Um, a lot of times uh, you may need to have a subscription. Um, it doesn't always like you don't, you may not have access to the channels unless you have a subscription. Um, but I took the minimal subscription. I think it was like either 15 or 20 a month, something like that. Um, and uh, you have access to all these GPTs that are um, 
that are, you know, uh, very geared towards certain fields. And one of them was PMI infinity. And why I loved it um, was because I could put in any question relating to project management and it completely gave very detailed explanation uh, using the terminology of PMI. And that's that's the difference. Someone else might say, oh, well, couldn't you just use ChatGPT as is? Uh, it's not going to necessarily use the terminology all the time of PMI. So, and 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 following those principles and following the, the you know, it, 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 it will be very similar probably because PMI is the dominant uh, you know, a project management source, you know, of, of knowledge, but um, it probably, it, it won't be, you're not guaranteed. So what I like about the PMI infinity was I could literally take its answers and that I could study it. And I knew that it wouldn't steer me wrong uh, and it would help me on my PMP. So that's awesome. Thank you so much for describing that. I'm a huge fan of chat GPT and I'm a huge fan of using AI for managing projects. Now, I don't think it does your work for you. It shouldn't do your work for you. If you're using it in that way, you're probably not being the best project manager, in my opinion, because <laughs> there is still a lot of human factor and yes. critical thinking associated with projects. And it's not going to have all of that knowledge and context that you need. So again, I'm not saying you should use it in place of doing the work yourself, but I do think that it can really, really enhance your project management skills and help you do things more effectively and efficiently. Um, on that note, I'm just really curious, you know, what are your thoughts on incorporating AI into project management and where do you really see project management skills needing to be elevated in the future? So AI is a great tool that can help us as project managers find the right tool for that particular situation. Um, you know, it, you know, besides, I mean, researching, of course, you know, if you're looking for something and you know, rather than searching the web all over the place, you can ask AI, you get the information a lot quicker. Um, and also crunching data. Uh, you can be like, okay, I have this, I have this, I have this. Can you give me, you know, uh, kind of break it down into a table or, or you know, use this formula and calculate this for this situation or whatever? You can have it crunch uh, data for you. So that those absolutely, I think, is, is the obvious ways that most people know how to use AI, and 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 those are good. But AI can also be really good for knowing what is the best tool in a particular situation. For example, if you are, um, you know, recently we were doing a kind of assessing a risk uh, situation. Um, and, you know, it was one of those, like there were so many factors and there were so many variables and it was just like, oh my gosh, how do you approach this? So I went to AI and, and I was like, okay, you know, this is the situation, this is the project, the, the, this number of variables, this number of this and that and all that stuff. What is the best risk matrix tool? Uh, and it was, it was great. It was like, you know, you can set it up this way. Da, 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 da. And it was really good idea that I was able to then make my own, uh, you know, accommodate it. And we were able to, you know, pretty much it was a, a you know, a kind of a, a, a cool decision tree uh, that we were able to make our own and it made sense. And it, you know, helped us to uh, assess the the situation the risk and come to a better decision for for the project uh and i you know we could have racked our brains and tried many different things and it was really cool to be able to just quickly it saved us hours of of just you know trying many things uh and it really geared us to exactly what would work so that we could focus on getting that tool to work even better uh and 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 deliver uh the results that's fantastic. And I think you nailed it because three fourths of using an AI or a generative AI tool is how you're prompting it, right? And yeah. if you don't have the project management skills or knowledge and you're not using the appropriate prompts, you're you're not going to get what you want out of it. So right. I think that it's really key that 
you use it as brainstorming with specific prompts and then have it tailored to your project or the organization that you're working with, because that is how you're going to get the best outcomes. You've got to take into consideration the technical side of it and the people and culture side of it. And different cultures require different approaches. So I don't think that there's just an off the shelf way of doing things. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let me just open it up then. Is there anything else that I haven't asked or that we haven't talked about that you think would be really helpful for people that are interested in pursuing the PMP to know? Um, one thing that I do, uh, and you did hit upon it, like kind of what what would be, uh, what would elevate uh, project management skills in the future, especially um, emotional intelligence, uh, persuasion, and partnering. Uh, emotional intelligence is super, super, super important. Uh, it's the part that I think PMI is starting to look into a lot more uh, because they're realizing, yes, we are all about processes and we're all about products, but you can't do neither without understanding people. Uh, and so you really, that, that ability to understand people, to be able to collaborate, to partner, to persuade, to, to, to give good arguments, to, uh, uh, uh give good business cases, to understand, uh, what people are communicating, what they're not communicating, how, you know, what, what people are really asking for, and, and, you know, whether they're using certain ways or, or not. Uh, you know, th those kinds of things are very, very important. Uh, so it's so, um, you know, it, it's it's really key. I think if you can uh, increase your skills in that area, it will only make you a more, uh, you know, uh, marketable uh, project manager. Uh, because, you know, uh, being able to manage people, whether it's a, a team, whether it's cross-functional team, whether it's peers, and even manage up, uh, is becoming more and more of a very necessary skill uh, in our business. Um, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, especially in, in Disciplined Agile, they talk about, you know, what what are what's restricting values, you know, the, 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 the value delivery, um, you know, in projects. And a lot of times it's, um, you know, delays and bottlenecks that people may not even be aware of, uh, because we don't, we just don't communicate well. We're not communicating with each other. We're not understanding that, you know, what's a priority for me is not a priority for you. And because it's not a priority for you, it's at the bottom of your pile. Uh, and I'm like pulling my hair out, trying to re reach a deadline. And, you know, it, it we're like not at cross purposes. Uh, someone else might be like, it's all about the, you know, the gates and, 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 and hitting the gates and, and, and getting the job done and, you know, all that that and the other person's like wait a minute there's a holistic project going on we we have to be flexible and be able to to adapt uh and so you have this 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 kind of clash uh in cultures and i see how that totally it's it's killing businesses i mean it's 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 hurting corporate cor corporations uh, across across private and public sectors uh at more than people want to admit um, and that's where I think when you have people who are like, wait a minute, okay, how can I bring value and get everybody around the table to agree and to come to a consensus and alignment and cooperate and collaborate, remove silos. When you have people who have those skills, uh, and upper management allows them and gives them the platform to use those skills to, to, to help, it really, 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 really will benefit. Um, so, you know, if you're in upper management, definitely you want to be hiring and, and looking for people like that. And if, uh, and if you are up and coming, you want to have those skills so that you can shine, uh, when upper management is looking for that. Cause they will, they will, they will be looking for that because once they realize that that's what's hindering, uh, their, their progress and their ability to make a profit, um, you know, they will be looking for people with those skills. I absolutely love your answer because there's some research that shows that people with high emotional intelligence, they actually surpass people with high IQ at some point in their careers because they do such a good job of reading other people, 
adjusting their behavior accordingly and so forth. I'm a big advocate for um, DISC workplace because it helps you better understand yourself, that self-awareness, which is a big part of EQ. And then you have to learn to better understand others. And then when a situation calls for you to kind of make trade-offs or adjust your natural style to behavior that better aligns to that situation. So I'm a huge advocate for developing your project team and better understanding each other. And you mentioned culture. We have so many global projects now or organizations that are working in different time zones. And when we talk about DISC workplace and better understanding yourselves, we have our inborn preferences. So kind of our personality, mm -hmm. we're born that way. But our experiences make up such a big part of how we behave in the workplace or on a project team. So bringing those two things together and understanding and embracing the differences, that really helps you get better project outcomes. So I love that. And that that's something I learned a little bit later than I would have liked to in my project management career, <laughs> because you learn the technical side first, like, yes. oh, I can bang out a project schedule, really define yep. all of that scope and make sure that we've got resources and I understand the budget. I mean, on paper, this project should go perfect, but then in reality, you bring people in and it's going to get messy. And it's a whole nother ball game. Yeah. Yes. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today and really just shining such great light on how to best prepare for PMP, some things to consider. I think that this is really beneficial information and thank you, Joanne. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me on. During this interview, you heard us talk about several things that Joanne used to help her study for the PMP exam. I want to just reinforce them. So the first one here, the PMBOK guide 7th edition, this is absolutely something that you'll want to know inside and out prior to sitting for the PMP exam. So it's fairly thick. The current version has 274 pages. If you become a PMI member, you will get a discount off of setting for the exam and you can get a free electronic version of this PMBOK guide. I'm going to publish a link in the comments for a frequently asked questions on PMP. The second guide that Joanne talked about was the Agile Practice Guide. This is a much thinner guide. It's got 166 pages. And I'd say the font is fairly big. Strongly recommend getting very, very familiar with this, learning it inside and out. This is also something that you can get from Project Management Institute. It is one of the reference documents for the PMP exam. Joanne also talked about how she went through a PMP boot camp. So typically these boot camps are 35 hours in the classroom. Some are offered virtually where you can go once a week. Some are back to back full days. And you want to make sure that you are going through your PMP exam prep with an authorized training provider. So Project Management Institute authorizes companies to really train people. And there is authorized materials that come along with that, that they make sure aligns with the exam. So that is definitely a question to ask if you're looking into PMP boot camps. There's lots and lots out there. One of my favorites is called Cheetah. If you look up Cheetah PMP exam prep, that's a great one. This is the book that you will get to help you prepare if you go through one of the authorized training providers, roughly 300 pages. It is not intended to teach you to become a project manager. It is intended to get you aligned with Project Management Institute's terminology and approaching projects in the way that they embrace. Thank you so much for joining me. Again, I'm Candace Porter, and I would greatly appreciate if you like this video, if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to the channel if you're interested in more about project management.